All right, let's get started. So, knock knock, who's there? My talk is going to be about JSON Web Tokens, and especially JSON Web Tokens when used with single page applications. So, who of you has been working in the past or is currently working on a single page application? I guess that's almost all of you, right? Okay, cool, it's good to know. Otherwise, it would, would maybe not be that interesting for you, but um, let's get started. First off, let me introduce myself. My name is Sam, I'm from Belgium, which is not that far from here. Um, and I'm a developer evangelist at Auth0. If you don't know Auth0, basically we're an identity as a, as a service company and we try to make it as easy as possible for everybody to implement a secure authentication flow so you can focus on actually building your products. Um, I'm also a Google developer expert and I organize a bunch of meetups, Frontiers in Belgium, um, the Identity and Security Meetup in London. And should you want to follow me on the internet, Sambigo is, uh, is my username on almost any website. So, let's get started, and let's get to the most important slide of my whole slide deck. I have cat stickers. So, if you want to have a cat sticker, tweet me a picture of your cat, your dog, your bunny, your pet gorilla, doesn't matter. Just tweet me a picture of an animal, and I'll give you some stickers after this talk. Who likes a sticker? I want to see more hands, I'm a bit disappointed. But okay. Um, for those of you who want to, tweet me, um, and I'll give you some stickers. Now on to the real business. This is what, we're going to be, what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to see a bit about traditional authentication. Um, we're going to see what a token is, and then we're going to look into token-based authentication. So traditional authentication. What do I mean with traditional authentication? It's uh, authentication with web apps which are traditionally um, generated on the server, which where all the business, log business logic is handled on the server, the authentication is handled on the server. This is how we used to make web apps for a lot of years, and we still do in some instances, and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, so have, let's have a look at how this works. We all, we all know this scenario where you have a user which uh, types in your URL of your app um, or your service in the browser bar, and the browser does a request to the server. The server is going to generate a page and send that back um, to the browser, and the user sees that page. But sometimes the page the user wants to see is protected. The user needs to authenticate, needs to log in with a username and password. Um, so the, user, the, the, the server is going to send back a login page or whatever, and the user needs to enter their credentials. Sounds familiar, right? It does. Um, so the user enter this cred enters their credentials, a username, a password, could also be a, an email address or something. Um, we send this to the server. And once the server has um, determined that these credentials check out, it will send back the protected page and the user can um, continue using your service, your website. Um, but it will not only send back that page, it will most of the time also send back a session cookie, which means that the user doesn't have to log in with each, sub each sub subsequent um, page, page request. Um, so what happens is the next time the user as asks for a page that is protected, we're going to send along this session cookie. If the session in this cookie matches, we're just going to send along the page anyway, and the user doesn't have to log in, um, because that would be very annoying. So we've seen how a traditional web app usually um, handles authentication. What's the difference with a single page application? The traditional architecture is usually or is often one-to-one. -one. You have your web app and it's related to a server. This can be a bunch of servers, but it's usually handled on this one service, this one uh, server. Um, well, when you have a single page, um, single page architecture, it can be something like this. You can have a bunch of microservices, or your app lives in one domain, and your services live in, or your APIs live in different domains, like one for a general API, one for user data, one for payment data. Who, says, who has used an architecture like this before? I guess it's getting more common. So everything has their own domain, um, and this poses some problems. You can also have a multi-architecture, like you can have a mobile app, a single page application, a desktop app. And the funny thing is, only web apps use cookies to store stuff. A mobile app is not going to do this. A desktop app is not going to do this. So it would be nice if we could use our sessions or generate the sessions or, or stuff like this in the same way for all the different apps for mobile, for, for a web, and for desktop which is currently not possible with cookies. Um, so what are some of the problems with the cook traditional cookie-based approach? Cookies don't like cores. Who likes cores? <laughs> don't lie to me. Nobody likes cores because when you get a cores issue, the first thing you do is you open up Google, you type in cores, you go to Stack Overflow, and this is one, one answer which answers all questions about cores because nobody knows how it really works. 
And cookies don't really like it because a cookie, a cookie is issued by a certain domain, by a certain server, um, and cannot just send it to another server. It doesn't work like this. Cookies also require state. Session cookies, um, they, contain, they usually contain a session which is stored on the back end in a database, and you have to go and check that session every time uh, you want to use that cookie. So they require state. And cookies don't flow. You cannot pass along a cookie from one, from one server to another that easily. Um, so that can become a problem if you have multiple servers, multiple APIs, and want to share some data. You want to share your authentication state over these um, services. Um, for example, your app does a request to your API, your main API, and that main API wants to have some user data. It cannot pass that cookie from the API to the user um, endpoint, for example, um, which can become a problem. So what's the solution? Maybe it's token-based authentication. Um, we're going to see that later. But first, what is a token? Because it's a bit of an abstract thing. And according to me, a token is a unique identifier that's representing something. And this something can be anything, as long as you can match that token to a certain state or a certain action, it's fine for me. And there's a bunch of different tokens like an access token. Who's ever heard of an access token? A lot of you, most of you, good. A refresh token, some hands. Basically, an access token um, determines if you can access a certain resource, um, and they're often or usually very short-lived. A refresh token lets you request new access tokens. An ID token, show of hands. A bit more, that's OK. An ID token usually contains some information about a user, the identity of a user. Um, so yeah, these are some kinds of tokens. Um, and they are often an opaque string in the form of a UUID, which means this is a string with seemingly random characters, but they don't contain that much information, except that they're an ID. They can also be XML if you're using SAML, for example. Um, but they can also be JSON web tokens. Um, and that's something that changes the game a bit because a JSON web token does contain a lot of information or can contain a lot of information, whereas a UUID, for example, is just a representation of that ID. So at Auth0, we use JSON web tokens as much as possible because we like them. Um, but yeah, so there are three different kinds of tokens. This slide should be way, um, it should be a bit before this, but. We've seen this, so let's skip them. This is a JSON web token, and as you might see, there are three different parts. Who's ever noticed that a JSON web token is made out of three different parts? That's a lot of people. OK. For those of you who've never seen this, ah, it's OK. You'll learn maybe a thing or two. Um, so let's get started and have a look at, at the different, um, different parts of a JSON web token. It starts out with the first part, and this is the header. And basically, this is just a base64 encoded JSON object. And what this JSON object contains is some metadata about the token itself, um, which algorithm is used, is used to sign it. And what it is, it's type JSON web token. So the header contains some more information about the token itself. And then we end up at the big blob in the middle, which is the payload. And this, again, is a base64 encoded JSON object, which can contain anything that is of importance to you. This can contain your subject, your given name, your family name, when it was issued, when it will expire. And this is something that's really interesting, because a JSON web token can have its own expiry date. So you don't need to go and check its authenticity if it's still valid on your server in your database. It can tell you if it's already expired or not, um, which is one of the strengths of a JSON web token. And there are uh, different kinds of claims. And the claim is a, um, a key value pair. Um, and the first class is reserved claims, which is subject, issuer, issued at, expiry date. Um, these are all claims that are defined by the spec of the JSON Web Token. Um, these are um, useful because um, an expiry date, for example, is something that you will probably use when using JSON Web Tokens. Um, and the second one are public claims. These are, not, um, these are not key value pairs that are really defined by the spec, but there's another list um, created by IANA which is this list. I don't know if you can see it from the back. Let me enlarge it. But basically, there's a whole list of other claims which are commonly used by APIs defined by IANA, just so that all APIs are a bit the same or have uh, kind of the same um, claims. 
And then there's the last part, private claims, and this can be anything you want to put inside of a JSON web token, as long as it's valid JSON. All right. So we've seen the first part, the header, we've seen the payload, on to the third part, which is the signature. And what's important is that you can always prove the validity of a JSON web token through the signature. So what do you take? You take the base64 of your header, you add a dot, you take the base64 of your payload, and then you just um, take a hashing signing function, it can be HMAC, it can be something else, and you just um, use that function to get the signature of the header and the payload, and you get back a signature. So should something change in the header or in the payload, the signature will also change. So if you try to tamper with the contents of a JSON map token, the, the signature um, will tell you that it's not valid anymore. So JSON map tokens can be verified. Um, again, an example with a, uh, your super secret key, it usually is something more random, which you should keep secret, of course. Um, but these are all um, very linear, very simple signing um, algorithms. And first, let's have a, a look at how you create a JSON web token. So you take the base64 of some JSON, your header, your payload, you sign it, and what you get is a JSON web token. And if I would copy this and go to jsonwebtoken.io and paste it in here, you would see that um, it contains the data that we put in it. And you would see that it's invalid because I used a secret, which was secret and not secret. Um, so by just combining this header and this payload and signing it, you kind of know all the information you need to use um, JSON web tokens. If you want to do it in JavaScript, it looks a bit like this. Again, you take base64, base64, and then a signing function. Um, and this was, a, it was all using a symmetrical algorithm, using a secret key. You also have asymmetrical algorithms, which take a private and public key to um, sign your um, JSON web token. There's a bunch of algorithms. Um, you can choose any of these. They will all work. And when you use such an algorithm, you need to share your keys because your server needs to know the key and with which uh, it needs to prove the, uh, the, the uh, authenticity of the JSON web token. And that's usually done with a JSON web key, which uh, looks a bit like this. So this is another JSON type, a JSON object, which contains a lot of information about your public key, which you can use to verify the signature of your JSON web token. Um, if you use the OpenID, uh, connect um, framework. These are often um, exposed at this URL, for example, for my all zero account. Um, and if you click on it, it just looks like this. The same thing. It contains all the information about my public key, which you can use to verify the, the JSON web tokens issued by me. Um, so JSON web token, JSON web key. You also have JSON web signatures. You also have JSON web encryption. You have a whole bunch of JSON web whatever. I'm not going to talk about all of it. Um, but it all makes your life a bit more easier when working with signatures and encryption on the internet. So let's make a little comparison. On the right, the right, you have a picture of my password. I'm from Belgium, so it's in four languages because it's logic. Um, and on the left, you have the header of a of a JSON app token, and it kinda, it's kind of comparable because on the, the front of my password it says it's a password from the Kingdom of Belgium, while the header of a JSON app token contains some uh, metadata, metadata as well. I'm a JSON app token, and I'm signed with this algorithm. If you go to the payload, it's kind of similar to the data in your passport. My password, it says my name, my surname, when the password expires. The same can be true for a JSON app token payload. It can contain a lot of information uh, you need. Um, like a given name, like a family name, um, like an expiry date. And the signature is more or less like the UV protection thingies on a password or, or fingerprint thingies. It basically shows that it's a valid ID, uh, it's a valid passport, or it's a valid JSON web token. Right? So let's see the next action. I have this very little um, API. Can you see it in the back, or do you need to enlarge it? Let's just say that you can see it. Um, and you have two endpoints. You have a public, uh, you have a dog request endpoint, which will get you pictures of dogs. Um, 
and you have a cat's request um, endpoint, which will get you pictures of, of cats. But of course, cats are a bit more bastard than dogs, so you need to, need to um, authenticate before you can get cat pictures. So we're going to send along a JSON web token, and we get along a cat picture. Um, this is all standard. This is um, something you've maybe used before. But if you would um, use, for example, an expired JSON web token, you immediately know that this JSON web token is not valid anymore, and it will say the JSON web token is expired. If you use one of which you change something in the payload so, and the signature doesn't match, it will tell you the same message. So by just looking at the, the information that the JSON web token gives you, you know if you can trust it, if it's valid or not, um, which is one of the strengths of a JSON web token. If you want to know more, there, there's this website which we created, jsonwebtokens.io. It's uh, this website right here, where you can encode and decode um, JSON web tokens and find a lot of libraries to work with them. I encourage you to have a look if you're interested in it. Um, but let's keep going. So are there any downsides to JSON web tokens? Invalidation of tokens is a bit harder. Um, let's imagine that you start working for a company uh, today, but you turn out to be a very huge asshole, so they fire you on the spot. Uh, but you logged in, logged in into their systems, and your JSON web token might be valid for a week. Um, according to that JSON web token, you're still allowed to go into that system for the rest of the week while you just fired that guy. So to invalidate that JSON web token, you have to start creating some kind of blacklist. Um, so it makes it a bit harder because you kind of trust what's inside of that token, but sometimes that's not correct anymore. Um, and if you leak your secret or key, they can kind of just forge your um, JSON web tokens, which can be a headache. So never ever leak your secrets and keys. But I think that's obvious, right? Um, and don't put sensitive data in your, in your JSON web token because, as, you've, uh, as I've said before, your payload and your header is just a base 64 of a JSON object, so anybody can just go and decode those parts of your JSON web token. So only put data in there that's not sensitive, that's public to everybody. So we've seen the traditional approach to authentication. We've seen what tokens are or what JSON web tokens are. So let's see how to use them with token-based authentication. We have a user, browser, server. Um, the same as, as before, but now we're running a single page application, a React application, a, uh, an Angular application, or something like this. And we want to uh, access a protected resource. The user enters his credentials, and when they check out, we're sending back an access token. Instead of a cookie, we're sending back an access token uh, in this approach. Um, and we save this access token somewhere in memory. Um, never ever save tokens somewhere persistent like local storage or in XDB because they might be vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So save them somewhere in memory. And if you want to access another protected resource, send along that access token. So it's kind of the same, but instead of a cookie, we use an access token. And when that uh, token checks out, you get your data back. Step by step again, the user fills in the login form, we pass that data. Um, if it's okay, we get data back. Um, and this is what, look, what it looks like in some JavaScript. The most important part is that we send it along as a bearer token um, and an authorization header. So that's your JSON web token you pass along there. So who's ever used or heard of OAuth? Most of you, I guess. Um, OpenID Connect, a bit less. OpenID Connect is basically you take OAuth and then you add an identi identity layer on top, um, which returns ID tokens. Um, OAuth does not spe specify what a token should be, so it can be a string, it can be a JSON web token, it's up to you. OpenID Connect does specify that a, an ID token needs to be a JSON web token. So it's just an extra layer on top of OAuth to get um, easy access to user identity uh, information if you want to. And if we have this scenario, we have two servers now. We have a separate authorization server and the rest of our API. So the user does a request. You get back your access token. But you don't only get back an access token. You get back a refresh token, an ID token, and an access token. And you, so you store them somewhere in memory. And you use that access token to get whatever you want from the API. Um, and if the access token is, is correct, you get your um, data back. But does this mean that the user have to log in every time they visit? Because, as I've said before, you should never save your tokens somewhere persistently in the browser because of cross-site scripting. 
Yes, unless you find a clever way around this. And what people usually do is the same login flow, so the user enter enters credentials and stuff like this. But you send not back not only an access token, not only a refresh token, an ID token, but also a cookie. So we're back to cookies again. Um, and you save those tokens in memory, and you save your cookie where you save cookies. Um, and with each subsequent visit to your uh, API or website, we're going to send this cookie in the background, often in an, in an iframe, to the authorization server. And on Bootstrap is the first thing you do. And then in the background, we get our tokens back so we can um, use them in the future. So going from don't use cookies, we're back to cookies just because of security reasons. And then you can use your tokens the way you want to. This is using the auth implicit flow, and there's been a lot of fuss about it lately. Um, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, has um, issued a, a message that you should try to avoid this flow in the future because of some issues with the flow that it's um, not the most secure flow, but it is the easiest flow to use with single page applications. So they recommend you to use the authorization code with proof key for code exchange flow. It's very difficult to pronounce. Um, but it looks a bit like this. You um, provide your credentials, your username and password together with a code challenge to your authorization server. It will return a, do something with this code challenge and will return a code. You take that code, do something with it, and then send that code together with a verifier to your authorization server, and then you'll get your tokens back. This means that you can always verify that these tokens were issued to you and not to somebody else. So, so if somebody steals your tokens, it, they cannot really use them anymore. So it's a more secure flow, um, and they recommend using this flow. So does this approach solve course with things it does? I'm the only one? There's one brave guy. It does, because you can pass along tokens to any other origin that you want. It's a token, and as long as you know the secret or the key to verify its, its signature, you can kind of use these tokens, right? Does this approach solve flow? Who thinks it does? I think it does. Because you can pass along these tokens to any other server service you want. As long as this server, this service, knows the signature, uh, knows the key or the secret to um, verify its signature. Does this approach solve keeping state? Who thinks it does? That's good, because in theory, JSON app tokens should solve state, but then you get to some security loopholes, like you have to create a blacklist for tokens that are revoked, or um, if you want to uh, s save them in memory and then issue new tokens every time the user um, visits your website with this session cookie. So it should solve state, but in theory, uh, or in practice, it does not solve state. So to summarize, Using session cookies is hard with single page applications because of course, because of flow, because of state in some way, um, and because cookies are really typical for the web, but not for mobile apps, for example, or desktop apps. Um, status authentication is pos possible, Asterix. In theory, it is. A JSON app token really provides you all the information you need to verify its authenticity, to verify if it's um, still valid or not, but because of reasons, you do need a little bit more state. And JSON Web Tokens consist out of three parts. The header with some metadata, your payload with any data you need, and your signature to verify that it's still a valid JSON Web Token. If you want to know more, um, jsonwebtoken.io, it has all the information you want. We also have a blog post about the, the thing going on with the implicit flow uh, with auth instead of the PKCE flow, which is now the recommended one. And we have a bunch of blogs, uh, blog, art, blog articles as well. If you want to see, see these slides, jwt.sambiga.tech. I will update them later, um, but there's already a version here. If there's questions, just come find me um, in the hallway later or tomorrow, or ping me on Twitter. Um, thank you.